Cool. So hi, everyone. I'm Luke Marsden. Uh, this is my colleague, Kai Davenport. Um, we've done um, some prototyping so far, and we're going to um, continue uh, developing Bacalhau with all your help, hopefully. Um, I wanted to start by just saying, yeah, let's, let's make this a discussion. Um, I really, for me, a, a goal for, for this summit is to make what we're building better because we've got all of your input. Um, and Juan, your uh, presentation was helpful already in, in terms of giving us some more ideas. And um, I know there's, yeah, so many smart people in the room. So yeah, please jump in and, and suggest different ways of doing things compared to the ideas that we're presenting. Um, nothing, nothing is sacred. So yeah, with that, um, we've already uh, talked a, a lot about vision, but just high level um, computers are a major missing part of the Web3 stack. Um, we, we think we've got a good crack at, um, at solving that in, um, in a way that also creates a, a framework that lots of other people can be successful in, uh, in that context. And ultimately, long term, I, I think we want an open, trustless market for compute. But we're not doing that from day one, like everyone has said already. Um, that is kind of the eventual goal. Um, and we are in the process of laying the foundations for that. Um, so yeah, to come back to Juan's triangle, um, there's this, this triad of, of trustless compute. It's a little bit like the cap theorem in distributed systems that you can kind of only choose two. And like Juan said, there are going to be lots of different approaches that fall in different places uh, in this space. And so for example, there's uh, cryptographic verifiability, being able to uh, generate a proof by doing some intensive computation uh, to be able to prove that you did a piece of work without disclosing anything about the work. It's crazy maths. I don't understand it, um, but it's, uh, it's very impressive. Um, but of course, it has performance implications. And then there's homomorphism where you can encrypt a piece on the client, ship it to the server. The server does some computation on the um, encrypted work, on the, on the encrypted data, and sends back an encrypted result without the server ever even seeing what the data was. It's crazy in my opinion, but it's, it's, it's really cool maths. But um, it's, uh, again, it has, it has performance implications. Um, and then there's this kind of alternative approach to optimistic verifiability, which is more like um, you let people do the work, you assume that they're doing it correctly, but you also sometimes check. And sometimes you check later, or sometimes you check kind of quickly, um, uh, but you use that as a kind of economic incentive to catch people out. These are all things that we want to support in the framework that we're creating with, with Bacalhau, but we are not going to try and solve all of these things from day one. We want to create a space where other people like you can come and contribute, um, provide implementations of the interfaces, iterate with us on the interfaces, because we're probably not going to get the interfaces right from day one. So come and try and build stuff with us. and. Um, we'll make it work. We'll change whatever needs to be changed to, uh, to get that stuff um, to work. And then we'll build yeah, this framework for, for all of these pieces. So like I said on the slide, these are advanced topics. We've got some much more basic stuff that we need to get right first. I've already said this. The goal is to, is to be a framework. We want our code to be reusable. We want the, um, the network that we deploy uh, to be runtime extensible eventually, um, a, a bit like libp2p. Connie should really be the, the data developer, not the consumer, um, which means I should probably change her name, but never mind. So Connie is the consumer. Um, she just wants a way to be able to, with a great developer experience, specify a job and get it to run with no hassle, um, and eventually pay a fair amount of money for that job, for that work to be done and, uh, and get the result back and be able to be confident that, that the result is correct. Peru, the provider, um, wants to be able to deploy Bacalhau onto a bunch of servers where they're already running um, IPFS and or Filecoin um, and efficiently uh, be able to accept jobs where they already have the data locality because like Juan said, data has gravity. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so eventually Pru, the provider, would want to be able to generate an additional revenue stream by running this um, adjacent to their Filecoin nodes as in running our server on the same machines that they're running, um, uh, Lotus and so on, um, 
eventually. And then there's, there's also Bluebell, the blockchain developer, and that's probably you lot, um, I think, are people who are developing um, uh, solutions in this space that, that want to collaborate so that you don't have to solve every problem yourself. It's a bit like in the early days of web servers and things like that. Um, Apache had to re-implement so much stuff in C to do basic things like forking processes and, um, uh, and being able to shell out, uh, being able to scale. And, and these days there's frameworks like, um, like Golang that do so much of that work for you. And so if you wanted to implement a pa the Apache web server from day one now, you wouldn't have to go and implement all that stuff yourself in C. You'd be able to build on the shoulders of, of giants. And so um, that's, that's kind of the framework that we want to enable here. Yeah, high level, um, there's this kind of conceptual overview of what we're building is there's P 2 p at the core, at the very lowest level, um, uh, and that's just how the network is going to um, manifest and the peers are going to talk to each other. And then there's IPFS, a layer on top of that um, with, with IPLD, which is, as everybody here probably knows, a super useful protocol that can be used to move things around and do content addressable storage. Um, and then the piece that we're going to build, and this is really the focus of the project, is this core scheduler piece um, that can be extended with the various different sort of pluggable verifiers that can be plugged in on top. Going a little bit deeper into, um, uh, into the interfaces and the pluggability, I'm not going to read every word on this slide. We have a whole other talk on pluggability after this one, which probably will be shorter than this talk and then lead into discussion, hopefully. But um, but yeah, the, the different, I, I will quickly level pieces here. The scheduler is this core piece, which is able to allow the user to express, I have a job, it has this job spec, um, I want to run it, and to then coordinate with worker nodes or um, uh, compute nodes that, that have spare compute and are available to do that work. And so the scheduler interface there, so there is a scheduler interface in our code, but the scheduler itself is core. And so the interface might one day be used for swapping the scheduler out for like a smart contract based implementation of the scheduler. But the scheduler itself is not designed to be kind of runtime pluggable. Whereas the, the, the parts of this diagram that have a little asterisk on them are designed to be runtime pluggable. So that's an important distinction. Um, so, yeah, everything talks to the scheduler. Basically, the scheduler is the heart of the system. We're going to hang a reputation system off the scheduler. Um, initially, we're just going to make that, like, um, like Dave said, kind of a reporting-based reputation system. So it's just going to publicly keep track of, of which nodes um, behave well according to, um, uh, according to the verification uh, protocol. And then we've got the pluggable verifiers, pluggable compute, and pluggable storage. Um, pluggable compute is probably a reasonable place to start, and we'll go over this again later. Um, but uh, the idea there is primarily we're focusing on, on WASM and a deterministic subset of WASM because non determinism is hard. I'll talk about that in a minute. But we, we also already have implementation like pluggable compute that supports Docker, a Docker runtime and a Firecracker runtime um, for uh, doing kind of VM based isolation. Um, which is useful when, when Pru, the provider, is being asked to run untrusted user code. Pru really wants to know that the untrusted user code is going to execute in some sandbox that means that she's not likely to get rooted. Um, and then the pluggable compute will inter interface with the pluggable storage interface. Initially, we're just supporting IPFS um, for storage. Uh, eventually, we'll also have uh, an implementation for Filecoin. Um, and there's no reason why we shouldn't also have implementations for consuming storage from other systems as well, like S3. I see no reason not to support that eventually. And then there's the, the verifiers. And the, the verifiers are interesting because the way that you do verification will vary a lot depending on which one of these or some other stuff you're doing. Um, and so we'll talk uh, a bit later on about some proposals we have for, for decoupling the verifier and the compute interface so that you don't have to have, so that they're not tightly coupled and you don't have to have like, every compute interface shouldn't need to know about every verifier and vice versa. But we'll talk about that, talk about that in a bit. Um, 
So we have already developed a prototype over the last few months. Um, you will have seen that on, uh, on the weekly reports and, and the Slack channel. So what we did there was um, we implemented um, a scheduler on top of libp2p. It's just very simple libp2p gossip sub. Um, uh, all the nodes can um, connect to each other, they can discover each other, they can chat to each other. And um, then we have a scheduler implementation which allows you to submit a job. And at the moment, the nodes, they just record jobs that have been requested in memory. Um, so when a message comes in over, over gossip sub, I mean, Kai will talk about exactly how this works. Um, then, then it's recorded in memory. We have a CLI, which um, I'll talk about the, uh, the way that interfaces with the rest of the system in a second. We've got this Docker and Firecracker backend. And then we kind of, we, we went down the rabbit hole of non-deterministic execution in the prototype. And I feel like that was useful because we've learned a lot from doing that. And um, I can report back on kind of some of those findings. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about, about non-determinism in a second. But uh, the way we did that was with this trace-based verifier. So what you can see on, the, um, uh, on this graph here is what we're calling, in a non-deterministic context, evidence of work. It's not proof of work. It's not a, it's not a cryptographically sound um, proof that you definitely did work. But it's the trace of the CPU and memory profile of executing a job. And what we found, or, or the, the idea behind this is that it's kind of like a variant of the halting problem. Um, it, without running some code, the halting problem is without running some code, it's impossible to know whether it will terminate or not. Um, it, the kind of corollary of that is without running the code, it should be very difficult to predict what the CPU and memory trace of that code will look like unless you've already run it with the same data and, and you've, you've seen kind of how, how, it, how the execution proceeds. So this is just an example, I think, of a program that we made. It allocates a bunch of memory and then it, yeah, like it, it reads the data file into memory and then it, um, I think it just runs said 10 times in a loop with a five second sleep in between. But it was just like indicative of the fact that you can get these kind of useful traces out of the system, but those traces are noisy. Um, uh, and, and therefore, in order to compare those traces, you end up with a signal processing problem and you end up with a machine learning problem, actually, um, which, which makes um, getting confidence that, that things um, were run in an equivalent way into kind of a hard problem that has tolerances around it, which is we've got to the point of, of kind of saying that's one way of doing it we have established that it's definitely hard. <laughs> um, and we've, we've found the, um, uh, we, we've kind of found areas of research that we would need to do in order to, in order to get that uh, support for non-determinism into production. I'll talk about determinism a little bit later, but uh, just to kind of take a step back and give a big picture of, um, of what Bacalhau is, um, it's, really three things that we're building. There's the CLI, which is the interface um, to the scheduler mesh. Um, the CLI is really important because that's where a lot of the developer experience is going to be, and we need to make sure that that's like really a joy to use. Um, that CLI, um, yeah, I've got a more detailed diagram in a second, but the CLI talks to the scheduler. The scheduler makes, is, is responsible for placing work across the network, and then there's the actual job runner, um, which executes the work. So very big picture, there's, there's these kind of three different conceptual pieces. The way that they work in practice is that, um, uh, and thanks to the control plane team for this diagram, this was, this was helpful. Um, uh, the CLI uh, communicates with the Battle Yao server over JSON RPC. So we kind of assume that a, a client is also willing to run a Battle Yao server and in order to be um, to have that server act on their behalf for a long running job. Um, that is kind of the requester side. And then the compute node side is that um, actual execution of work. Um, they both subscribe to the scheduler. The requester node um, submits a job. Um, the compute node, which would then be running on a different server, probably uh, bids on that job. Um, uh, the, uh, and Kai, you're going to walk through this in more detail, aren't you? But um, the, um, the requester node um, then 
has to explicitly accept that bid. Um, so there's kind of a, a protocol already for, um, uh, for negotiating whether someone's going to do the work or not. Um, and then the compute node actually uses the runtime to spin up the job, um, download the data from IPFS. Uh, although in many cases it won't need to, of course, because the data is local. Um, and, uh, and then uh, submit the, both the evidence of the work and the actual results of the job um, back, to, uh, back into IPFS um, so that it can be consumed. In a little bit more detail, so this is what it would look like on a, on a single server. So this is kind of what production would look like. Um, you've got the CLI that's talking to the Bacalyao server. Um, the Bacalyao server right now uh, shells out to IPFS to, um, to read and write things from IPFS um, and to check whether um, the local IPFS node actually has a copy of the data. And Kai will show how that kind of self-selection works in a second. And then the IPFS um, uh, server will keep track of the, uh, the data and, and copy it around it if it needs to. The important part here is that the Bacalyao server then spins up a Docker or Ignite runtime. Um, Ignite is a project from a company called Weaveworks uh, in London that wraps Firecracker in a Docker-like um, CLI, basically. So you can do Ignite Run, and it spins up a VM, and it gives you a Docker-like experience. So um, it either spins up a, a Docker runtime. Docker runtimes are super useful in development and in CI, because you don't need hardware virtualization support. The Ignite runtime will be useful in, um, uh, in, in production where you, want to, where you potentially want a, a VM boundary for isolation. Um, and then this thing. Uh, it spins up a Docker container or a VM. In both cases, it calls that the runtime. And then it starts another IPFS daemon inside the VM runtime. And the reason it starts another IPFS daemon is that we found IPFS is a super useful way to move data around. And, in, in, and it's also a super useful way to move data around on localhost, um, because this IPFS daemon won't, isn't long running. So it won't have the copy of the data that is here, but it can stream it from the host into the VM. So it's a very efficient way of, of streaming that data over the VM boundary. Um, and, and that means you don't have to copy the input data from the host into the VM, which is nice because we want to avoid having to copy that data. That's the whole point. So the user code can then just read that data over this fuse mount. IPFS will stream it because I, the IPFS daemon inside the VM will uh, will peer with the IPFS server running on the host. It's all over localhost, so it'll run at like 10 gig plus speed to, to stream that data. Um, and, uh, and then the user code finishes executing, and we gather the results and, uh, and write them back. I also wanted to put up this uh, scribble that we made of how uh, DevStack works. So if you've tried the README, then you've probably tried spinning up DevStack. Um, DevStack is a super nice little a uh, tool that's part of the CLI actually, but it allows you to spin up a three node cluster just locally on your laptop. It spins up a libp2p network um, that's private. So it doesn't actually go out and try and talk to the uh, public DHT. That's really useful because um, we want to be able to, DevStack is used in our integration test suite basically. So it's a way to get fast, um, fast, like spin up of a stack that you can test and uh, both for interactive testing and demos and and also CI. So it, it spins up this um, private libp2p network. Uh, all of the Bacalyao servers um, are just assigned random ports on the host. They all are connected to each other um, by peering with each other. Um, and then it also spins up a, a bunch of IPFS servers that are also just running in processes on the host, and it gives them all a unique IPFS path. So they act like independent IPFS instances. And then it can also spin up multiple Ignite and Docker runtimes, of course, when you actually submit jobs. And then um, those things are like a microcosm of, of this thing, basically. So TLDR, we've got this cool thing called DevStack that allows you to spin up a, a demo stack of Bacalyao and run it entirely locally on your laptop or in GitHub Actions, which is where we wanted to do CI. OK, so I promised you that I'd talk about determinism, so I'm going to have my little determinism rant. 
Um, <laughs> the, um, so I, I actually believe, and I think Juan kind of alluded to this already, but in order for um, what we're doing to be generally applicable to the software engineering community at large, we are going to have to support non-deterministic execution. That's just because so much code is non-deterministic. Pretty much all the code that people outside of the crypto world write is non-deterministic. I mean, my like even the most trivial Golang program that I write is non-deterministic out of the box because Golang will change the order in which you iterate over maps. Um, sometimes I feel like it does that just to screw me up, but it, it's actually intentional because it, it tries to screw you up in CI so that you don't end up relying on Golang map iteration order in production. Um, it was a design decision by the Golang team. As soon as you have um, multiple thing, things happening in, in parallel, any, any concurrency in the system, you're going to end up with race conditions, um, and especially when you have multi-core. So if you have, um, if you support multiple threads, if you can run those threads on multiple cores, then the operating system scheduler is going to start running your threads at different times, and you're not going to be able to control when that happens. So um, you're going to end up with different ex different executions of the same program on the same data are going to proceed down a different code path every time you run them. Now we have testing frameworks. We have CI and um, and unit tests and integration tests for for the code that we write to kind of bound the behavior of the code to within certain um, certain sort of envelope of, of how that code runs, but the code is going to run in a different way every time you run it. And um, I don't think that we're going to replace the big cloud providers with this thing unless we can support this eventually. Another example is stochastic rounding, so floating point numbers. <laughs> um, when you have um, floating, when you do things in like machine learning, um, you will often uh, end up with the actual hardware generating entropy in the hardware to randomly round your floating point numbers up or down if they're exactly 0 0.5, because that results in better machine learning algorithms. But that is entropy that exists on the hardware. And then there's even just simple things like, like logging the date in your timestamps when you, when you do logging. So like, I guess this is me banging the drum. We are going to need to support non-determinism eventually. Um, and that's kind of why we went down the, uh, the non-determinism uh, rabbit hole, but it has these big implications for how you for how you do verifiability. Right, so I'm going to show a very quick demo of the prototype that we have. Um, it's going to use DevStack. Luke talked a bit about DevStack. Um, it's basically useful if you're developing a tool, which I hope some of you in this room begin to do. Um, how do we have some form of realistic network running on my laptop so I can change the code and quickly iterate in that DevStack? Um, the main job it does is save you manually copying out all the commands you'd need to do to bootstrap the network. So allocate random ports, all allocate a slash TMP directory for IPFS isolation, and boom, we should have a three node network. So let's make haste and see what that looks like. So we're gonna spin it up and it's busy creating three LIPTP nodes all interconnected with each other. Um, at the same time as allocating random folders in slash TMP. So we could start adding files to IPFS, but the whole point of Bacalao, the data has gravity sentence, which I love, um, is like, let's, let's send a job out into the network and only run that job on a computer where the data is local to the compute. So if you don't have the CID on your actual disk, don't attempt to run this job would be the, too long, didn't read. In order to test that out, we've got three nodes in our cluster. Let's add a CID to one of those nodes, submit a job, and say the, the node that has the CID on its disk should be the one that runs that job. And hopefully there we're getting around the fact that data has gravity by sending the compute to where the data is, kind of get the message by now, I could imagine. So let's first of all look at what file we're going to test on. We have this nice little I'm going to call grep the same as said, like Dave's point earlier, most data scientists use existing tools that are decades old, like let's grep and said are interchangeable for the point of this, like they're, they're existing tools that work for data scientists, right? Um, so if we have a look at what's in that file, it's some fruit. 
it's nothing, nothing big, nothing complicated. Um, we are going to grep that file for some fruit. That is the point of the job. Um, let's add that file to one of our three IPFS nodes. Uh, let's just, just you know, to prove what's going on here. Like we have an IPFS folder that is for out one node. It's all on the same computer, but let's treat IPFS path zero as node zero. It's not actually got any VM level isolation, but let's pretend it does. So let's add this file and then we should have a CID back. There we go. So we now have that data in IPFS on one of our three nodes. The next thing would be, uh, let's skip over this. By the way, this readme that I'm going through is on the repo, right? So this whole demo, you should be able to pull the repo, follow this readme just as I'm doing. Like, <laughs> I'm kind of cheating. I'm just copying and pasting from the readme. This is the demo, right? But the upside is you could do this yourselves. Let's submit this job. So if we look at this command, the basic saying back allow, which is the equivalent of go run dot because we're in development mode, um, target the JSON RPC server of the first node. Now, we could actually change that out. In fact, let's live on the edge and let's submit the job to a different node, one that doesn't have the data, for example, to demonstrate, like, let's go over here, but the job will be running where the data is. Um, what is the job? Well, it's grep for the word Kiwi in our file. Right, so it's nothing special, but that job should run where the data is. So let's run that, see what happens. Oh, I know what I've not done. Okay, yep, that's fine. Um, this whole bunch of text here are the environment variables that you need to export <laughs> in order for everything that I've just described to work because we've got three different nodes. So we have three different um, JSON RPC ports and three different folders. So I just skip that step. If we paste all of those in and we're running everything. Right, go again. We're going to submit the job to the node number one. Uh, our job is grepping for the word Kiwi in our file. Now, if you notice on the top there, we should be getting some compute nodes kicking in. I did, didn't I? Okay. Okay, we well, you know what we're gonna do. We're just gonna follow the readme. I tried to live on the edge, you see? I was giving it all the screens, not gonna, it's the screen that's the problem, but no, it's me that's the problem. Okay, right, just ignore me here whilst I do the obvious thing. Right, okay, step number one. We're gonna start a dev stack. Here we go. There it goes. That is going to print out for us all of our environment variables that connect to three different nodes. So that's these right here. We're going to export those in our environment down here. We are going file to node number one. We're going to say, do I have that CID? Yes, we do. And go to run a simple job like this. Yeah, that looks much better. So one of our nodes should have picked that job up and should be running it. The other two should have entirely ignored that job. And that's because of self-selection and I'll, you know, it's a simple concept. Do I have the CID locally on my disk or not is what we're calling self-selection. But I'll talk a bit more about self-selection in a bit because it's an important component of the system, like avoiding having a scheduler node, uh, uh, avoiding kind of having another entity in the network is what, why we're doing self-selection. Um, but if we now have a look at the state of the network in terms of jobs, we have a job and it says it's complete. Only one node has run it, not three. We have a results CID. We can copy the ID of the job there and we can say um, results list for that ID. And we can see we actually have a folder that's produced the artifacts of what that job has done. Um, and all of that data was retrieved over IPFS. You notice how we have an actual IPFS link here. That wouldn't work because we were in dev stack mode. So we're not on the public IPFS DHT. If we were actually running actual uh, nodes, um, that, then we'd be able to obviously view the results of that job on IPFS because the thing is all connected to the to the global IPFS DHT. But if we just have a look inside our local folder of what's happened there, I can make the... Right, so here is like the artifacts that the job produced. So we've got standard out, which we can have a look at. And I'm fully expecting to see... Um, okay, hang on. I'm fully expecting to see the word Kiwi in this, in this uh, file. 
because that was the entire job. There we go, Kiwi is delicious. These, these two lines here are to do with how we're wrapping the verification engine. We'll talk about that in a second, right? So basic demo done. We've said, hey, I've added a file to IPFS. One of those nodes out of the three has that data locally. Let's submit a job that uses that file. The node that had that data locally has run that file, right? So that's the general concept of avoiding data gravity. Let's make it slightly more interesting now and run a job on all three nodes, which is essentially an equivalent step of what we've just done. Um, but before we do that, we're going to add we're going to add the file to all three. Uh, all three nodes. So first of all, add it to node zero. Okay, let's actually get into the folder. First of all, add it to node zero. Then let's add it to the other two nodes as well. Okay, and that's that's printing out our CID. There we go. And then here's the, here's the difference. The key difference between this job and the last one that we ran. In this one, we're going to say concurrency three. And so let's imagine that we had a world where like the network is a thousand nodes and 200 of those nodes have the CID. And we're like, yeah, just everybody who wants to do it, run it. Well, the concurrency setting says, well, actually we only kind of need three people to run it because of the verification engine that we're using. How many people we'd want to run the job will be a function of which verification engine that we're using, right? So what we're basically saying is we want three people to run this job. The confidence setting is, how many of those people should agree for us to determine that those people were acting faithfully and the other person wasn't? And so essentially what we're doing here is an example of knowing which verification engine we, let me rephrase that, knowing which verification engine is suitable for the job that we're submitting, right? And that's a crucial aspect of this entire project and why we're almost why we're all here is to think about the different jobs that data scientists want to submit the different ways in which we'd want to verify them have a library a bit like libp 2 p that enables people to very quickly and easily implement those different verification strategies and so then surface them back to the people who want to submit the job so an example of that would be i've got a deterministic workload it's always going to produce the same result therefore i'm going to use some kind of hash based hash the results of the job because those hashes absolutely should line up because it's a deterministic workload, right? Another type of job, which Luke alluded to, is I'm going to train an ML model. There's no way in a month of Sundays that's ever going to be deterministic. How am I going to make sure that people are keeping honest? We need, let me just use the phrase, quote, more interesting verification modules at that point, right? So I think what we're looking at here is an example of given a trace-based evidence of work verification system, which is what we're using in this demo. It's essentially profiling the memory trace of the work being done. Um, how many people should attempt to run the work and how many people should agree are the two settings that we're using, right? So let's try it, let's see what happens. Let's run that. So it's essentially the same command. We're grepping for pair this time because why not? Um, and we're saying run it three times and two people should agree. There's two settings on the end. So at the top now we can see things getting a bit more busy, like three different Docker containers starting, running the job. Uh, obviously, you know, in the real world, this would be three completely separate computers, but we get to see the entire thing happening in front of us. Uh, it looks like something is, looks like something's happened. Let's have a look at what. So let's list the job now and we have whole bunch of results and the job I think is this one it's not the it's not the easiest of tables like definitely some work we could do on UX is to improve the output of the CLI entirely acknowledged I think we spent about 10 minutes plugging that table in to be clear so you know part of you know what would good UX look like discussion topic for the young conference um, let's have a look at the results for that job that's the interesting thing so results is for that job and we have the same output as before, as in, hey, I've run the job, I've put the results somewhere. And we have these three lovely green ticks because everybody was faithfully trying to do the work and was being honest, submitted the results. Where do those green ticks come from? We are comparing 
the memory traces and doing some k-means clustering kind of really doesn't matter what algorithm because hey we're going to develop an interface for the verification system and you could come up and roll your own version of verifying these results but for this example we're taking memory traces using k-means clustering and saying which are the outliers any and in this example the answer is there are no everybody did the work um, interesting questions get thrown up. What if all three people have lied? Well, now we're accepting all three people's erroneous results. So there's a lot of interesting discussion to have around verification engines and the different pros and cons that come with them. The final part of this demo makes this slightly more interesting. What we're going to do is start another dev stack, but this time with bad actors set to one, right? So what does bad actors do? It allows you to test what it would look like if somebody was trying to mess around. And essentially, if you're in a bad actors mode, um, what's just happened there? Oh, it's just switched the screen off, hasn't it? Which is then throwing my computer into... Oh, we're back, we're back. Okay, cool, there we go. Just ignore that bit. Um, bad actors says to a node, when you receive a job, bid on the job as though you were going to run it. When you get to actually running the job though, just sleep for 10 seconds, ha <laughs> ha. Nobody's ever gonna find out, right? So let's do that. To do that, we have to start DevStack again because at the moment we're running in, everybody is um, honest mode. So let's go into make DevStack bad actor. And essentially like DevStack has a flag, right? I could say DevStack with 20 nodes, five of them are bad actors. It's up to you how you, you know, what sort of numbers that we, we play with here. Uh, so let's copy these three, let's copy these lines so that we have our environment set up as it should be. Um, again, let's add the CIDs to all three nodes because we want all three nodes to self-select this time, right? We're not kind of doing an example of self-selection. We're doing an example of bad actors. So all three need data that gets us to there. Now let's run this job. And this time we're, we're running, we're running a grep job, but we're just throwing a little bit of extra, like actually allocate some memory so we can very, basically I want you to see some pretty graphs, right? That's what that's about. I'll explain that when we show the actual pictures. Uh, the, the core of it is it's the same job as before. It's a grep job. So let's paste that and hope our bash quoting. There you go. It's all working. So same job, same as, same as before. It's running three Docker containers with a job happening inside. You can see two of them have done a grep thing because we can see the phrase pair is nice. Um, and let's have a look at the network and see what the ne network is saying. And hopefully it should sort of get close to being complete. There we go. We have what looks like a successful job, right? Hey, three nodes have completed and finished their results and they've submitted their results. Let's have a look at the results. So results list for that job ID. And this time we get, oh, that's interesting. So two nodes have done what we've asked, but one of them looks a bit sketchy. So why? And we internally know why, because we started DevStack with bad actors one. So we know that that sketchy node has done no work whatsoever and still tried to claim the reward. Um, if we have a look in the folder now at the output, we can see something interesting. So first of all, uh, if we... I've made that small just so I can copy it, but let's make it big again. Right, so here is the output of a job that was working correctly. And if we have a look at that, standard out log. There we go, pair is nice. That's the same example as, you know, hey, we've run the job and it was the correct output. Let me copy the bad actors folder. But before I do that, let's open the graph that we get. Metrics to PNG. Right, so that is the graph of memory allocation for a thing that actually did the work, right? Uh, it's essentially just visualizing the tracing that we've plugged in to, to take the memory down. We'll talk more about how that actually works when we get to the interfacing interfaces section. If I zoom out again, so I can copy the bad folder. Here we go. Mm -mm -mm. Right, and then xdg open metrics.png. Notice how this looks very different, as in the numbers along the side are the notable thing compared to the other graph. 
Very, very wildly different numbers is the, the, the concept of, of the, the, that graph is trying to convey. Now, if we look back results that we were seeing in terms of the, the results for that whole job, we'll, each job, we're using a particular implementation of what we could call the verification interface. So there's a tool called PS Record, which essentially says, given any command, start it with PS Record and we'll record the memory metrics for what happens during the execution lifetime of that command. The graphs that we're looking at there are a visualization of those memory traces. Those, that evidence, this is the phrase to remember, it's not proof of work, it's evidence of work, gets transported back to the client um, in a production way, in a, it, it would be encrypted because, of course, if I'm a bad actor, I'm sat on the network and I see, you know, Luke just finished the work and he just broadcasts the results back to the client. I'm just going to go, I'm going to copy his results and submit those as my own results, right? So we have to encrypt the evidence between the person that did the work and the client. That evidence is then sent back to the requester node. The requester node in this whole stack, I'll talk through this in the diagrams, is like the custodian of a job, right? It's the thing that you submit, the CLI submits the job to the requester node. It then broadcasts it out to the network, but it's a long running process. And so as servers bid on the job, the requester node is the thing that says, hey, I've got five bids, I'm gonna accept these three bids. Those three nodes are the ones that run the work. The compute node then will send the evidence having run the Having run the job, it will send the evidence back to the requester node. The requester node is the thing that's combining all three sets of evidence, running k-means clustering to determine one of those people was lying because the other two uh, agree with each other. So the whole point of that entire system is it's one opinion over what we're calling a verification implementation. If all of a sudden we're thinking the workload is deterministic, that would look very, very different. We wouldn't need memory profiling. We would be hashing the outputs because we know they should be the same. Each job's going to have a different approach. The whole point, I think, of this project is to build a bit like libp2p, but for verification engines. Like it's a, a pluggable framework that saves you all of the hassle. And in terms of everything I've just described, the library should do for you. And you're just thinking, here is how I wrap a job. Here is how I produce some artifacts. Here is how I com compare different artifacts from different compute nodes to decide who is lying or not. And I think there's all sorts of different interesting implementations that we can look at there. This is, was a demo of one of those implementations. What did we just demonstrate? It's the lower level. There is some work that happened the compute node produces an artifact of having done that work and transports that artifact back to the requester node. The requester node looks at all the artifacts and makes a decision. So that lower level model that I've just described should be the thing that all of the verification implementations take, uh, make use of. And it's not an opinion about how we verify how the compute is done. It's more of the transport mechanism for getting those artifacts from A to B to then make a decision. So that's like the, the useful stuff that would have to be done for every verification implementation. That's the important part. The actual opinion, how should we verify these compute loads, I think is what we need to make pluggable and modular so that lots of people can submit different approaches. How do I keep a database of key values in a distributed way that does that has no centralized server? Like, as in, there's a lot more detail to the answer of how it actually works. But um, how do I keep state across a whole cluster of machines where no one machine is more important than the other? I mean, fine. How did I do? <laughs> is, is that what a DHT is? Yeah, one example of IPFS DHT is given a CID, which nodes have that CID, for example, right? And so it's just like, how do we keep that state across the whole network? The DHT does that job. How they actually work? Good question. One concept there would be, like, I'm going to bid on the job and I know I don't have the data. I've just cost myself a massive ingress bill. Slash, the, the other part would be, I'm, I never intend to even run the job. Then we're going to look at the verification engine catching them out. So the self-selection based on where the data is, is more of an efficiency system than a verification that something happens system. Like I said, I could still do the job and have to pull the data. So there's a couple of strategies, if I may. This is main, yeah. So there's a couple of strategies that we're looking at for this. Um, and these are longer term, they're like down the roadmap, because the goal is release something that's explicitly insecure as like a first pass and then iterate on it in public.
is you somehow distribute the verification jobs evenly across the entire network. And if you have a, a way of establishing the verifiability, you can therefore, on average, call people out over time. As in, that kind of solves the, oh, three, th like three, um, just running the job on three nodes is a small subset of the total network. So a 51% attack on that small number is, is easy, I think is what you were saying. Um, but uh, if you can, if we can evenly distribute the work overall across the entire network, then that's that's a strategy to to help solve that problem. And then there's a couple of other approaches which I'll just mention. I won't go into detail. But the other other approaches include a reputation system and also staking. Um, but those are again down the road. So a combination of just the requester, because it's like I'm responsible for submitting and tracking the lifetime of a job that's done somewhere else. Just the compute node, as in I just want to run jobs. I don't really care about submitting jobs or a combination of two. There's each backlog node essentially is a peer to every other one. There's no requester server. And the whole point of that is if I'm a CLI, I'm, I'm, I'm a user who wants to submit a job. So I throw the job into the void and at some point it will be done. There's a certain amount of long running, like as in I need some long running process that listens for bids coming in, listens for results coming in. As soon as the results have met my concurrency setting, now combine them. And you can't do that in a CLI. So that's all the requester node really is, is a long running custodian of a job submitted by the CLI. But it's the same as every other Bacalal node. It's not like some centralized server that has elevated permissions. But it, I mean, to be clear, it should be very, I'm going to say possible, not easy, to, for me to think, I've got, I've got a different approach to verification. So I'm going to implement a thing on the compute node that produces some artifact and I'm going to implement a thing on the requester node that compares all those artifacts. At which point, because it's just an implementation of the interface that, like the project that we're doing is, here's the interface. And then somebody goes, I've got a great idea for what would be a very expressive way to do the verification. So hopefully lots of people implement lots of versions of this interface and we have a whole ecosystem of expressive DSLs to decide on which is verified or not. And so the, I think the point of today, just to really, really reiterate is, um, let's not go down each and every rabbit hole of the demo that we've just seen. The demo we've just seen is a really rubbish way of actually verifying anything. It just demonstrates the transport layer between the compute node and the requester node and getting artifacts between one and the other and then comparing them to make some kind of decision. And I think, the point of the system is that that flow will remain the same irrespective of which application implementation. I'll skip through this quite quick. I was, I, I was thinking like if ever I was in a room where I didn't need this slide, it's probably this room, but just for anybody that didn't know, um, at the moment the prototype is libp 2 p network with sub. The scheduler interface, which we'll speak about in some time soon, uh, means that we could, in concept, replace this with a smart contract. Essentially, let's call this the transport layer for the system. It's how do we get a message from A to B. Uh, at the moment, Gossip Sub is how we're doing it. This is how Gossip Sub works. There's a whole network of peers using libp 2 p You put a message out and it slowly propagates through the system. Everyone can hear about it, depending on your subscriptions. I basically thought I want to learn how to do animating in Google Slides is the point of that slide. Uh, and I think I pulled it off, so there we go. Right, now we can actually look at what we just saw happen in the demo. Um, every Bacalal node has a JSON RP, well, every requester node has a JSON RPC server. So how do I actually interact with the system? There's a CLI slash, I can write code in any language I want, submit messages via JSON RPC to get stuff done, right? So here's, here's the message comes in, JSON RPC interfaces with the requester node, messages go out over libp 2 p the answer comes back, and the CLI can display something on the terminal like we saw in the demo. What is a backlog node? And this alludes to what we were speaking about just now. There's three main components. The JSON RPC is almost an afterthought, like it's, it's a necessary thing to get request into the other two components. But the requester node, this is the thing that says, I am responsible for the lifetime of a job, as in, I am essentially the client. I'm the one that this job is being done on behalf of. And the reason that the requester node exists is, 
there's a lot of back and forth going on. There's bids happening on jobs. Like there's nodes that's, that are um, marking the job as I, I would be willing to do this if you want me to. And then there's uh, results coming back. And there's a lot of messages coming back from the network with a job that you're interested in that you would need to react to when they arrive. So the requester node is the long running process that listens to the rest of the network for events that occur over jobs it cares about and reacts to those events by either confirming bids or rejecting results or doing the things that you would need to do as the custodian of a job. That's the requester node. The computer node is the other end of the whole system, the other end of the pipe, if you like. Um, hey, somebody wants something doing. I'm interested in doing that thing. Let's bid on that job. Hey, my bid got accepted. Let's actually run the compute. Um, let's submit the work. Let's submit the verification artifact back to the requester node. Um, so the back, you know, when we say a backlog node, it's those three things. I can very much run a backlog node just in compute mode, not really, you know, never intending really to submit jobs via the requester node and. In reverse, I could run a backlog node just in requester node mode and never really intending to run jobs myself. Now, whether we actually ship it as like a flag that says only start up the requester node or not, interesting, like I'd call that UX discussion. The important concept here is those three components combine into what we're calling a node and everything is peer to peer. There's no kind of server, otherwise <laughs> this is a different conference. Um, Right, self-selection. So this whole concept of um, it's not, it, you know, the requester node puts a job out there, right? It just says, I want this to be run. There's no concept really over, you know, checking that somebody does have the data for them to select themselves to run the job. The whole point of self-selection is to say, um, here's a job that will use the following data do you want to run it is there's no enforcement of the fact you actually have the data it's a convenience hook to say is it worth is if i run this job how much gravity would i have is another way to put it right so let's see what the, what happens when i don't have the cid the job comes in i'm a compute node i see that that job's arrived i ask my local ipfs server hey do you have that cid the answer is no so i just ignore that job or put another way i kind of choose not to run it right uh, not to bid on it. choose not to bid on it yeah the other the other example a job comes in it says i'm going to use the cid i look at my local refs in my ipfs repo i say oh look i do have that therefore i'm not going to have to incur a massive ingress bill uh, i do want to bid on that job and so self-selection is an interesting concept because it removes the need for kind of a global brain of this is who we want to run this job. That's not what's happening, right? You just you just throw the thing out there and you see what bites. In some ways, let's start with data has gravity and let's look at this as a very, um, I'm not gonna say naive, but an initial, an initial poke at how to filter out the, how much gravity would I need to have if I choose to run this job? That's the focus of this step, not, hey, let's protect against lots of malicious actors, right? This is more about, uh, how far would I have, how, how far would, I'm going to stop the gravity metaphor, but like how, how expensive would my ingress bill be if I choose to take this job on is really what this is more about than protecting um, any sense of attack. So let's have a look at the flow overall of what we saw in the demo real quick. So basically a job comes in via, from the CLI, via the JSON RPC server, it arrives with a requester node. The requester node says, I'm going to broadcast that job out to the rest of the network using gossip sub. So at which point any compute node that is active would hear, hey, this job is up for grabs. I can choose what to do with that job at that point. Um, this is where the self-selection thing kicks in. All of the compute nodes are busy saying, hey, do I have this CID locally or not? Some of them say yes, some of them say no. At which point the network is kind of filtered down to those that would consider running the job. Um, the bids are then put back, right? So there's this concept of a bid, which is I would be willing to run this job if you want me to. So the bids come back to the requester node and the requester node at some point later when we have it, financial incentives and a reputation system and all of the stuff you probably would need for the thing to work at scale, um, I might choose the, the reputation of one of those nodes is below my threshold. So I'm not even going to allow, you know, I'm going to deny them the opportunity to run this job. And that's up to the requester, right? Because it's the requester who is 
the one who would end up paying if we are looking at financial incentives. As soon as those bids are accepted, the nodes who had their bid accepted then run the job, produce some artifacts. How they produce those artifacts is very much up to the verification implementation that we're using for that job, which as we've learned already is open for debate what that should be, and it absolutely should be pluggable, so there should be lots of options. Um, the artifacts or results of that job come back to the requester node. The requester node, using the verification engine that we've used for this job, compares those jobs to each other, discovers one of them is an outlier or otherwise erroneous, and says, I'm going to accept the results of these two nodes and reject the results of that node. And there we go. Like, as in, there is the high level, what does, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we've ignored from, from that flow. But in terms of the stuff that should stick, there is a proposed flow. And what do we replace? We replace things like storage engines, compute engines, verification engines. These things can should be easily replaced with a different opinion. But the scheduler and the flow of a job isn't necessarily what we've seen in that diagram. But as a result of this conference, we should probably come to some consensus about what that should be. And then that should be the system that we propose out to the world with the various pluggable hooks that we've presented. So there's, it's the same as Luke said earlier, like the scheduler will have an interface, but it shouldn't really be pluggable. It just is. We, it means that we at some point soon could replace the libp2p gossip sub implementation with a smart contract implementation. That's the point of the scheduler having an interface. The compute storage and verification interfaces are absolutely designed for there to be lots of different pluggable modules and everybody hopefully will write lots of um, um, variations on that to, to, to suit different use cases. Um, yeah, cool. I'll pass back to Thanks, Luke. Friend. What um, I want to talk about next is, so we've showed you uh, the prototype, and we've shown you what it does, and we've already started poking holes in it. There's lots of ways that you can poke holes in the prototype. That's, that's why we built it. Um, the plan for what we do next now is to continue developing the Bacalao, uh, Bacalao project towards the, the goal of operating a production compute system. Um, the initial goals for that compute system are to be scheduler focused, reliability focused, and scale focused. Um, and in particular, there will be no incentive or payment system in the first um, version of this, or maybe even never in this specific project. There might be another project later to, uh, to develop that. Um, and so what I wanted to propose here um, is that in order to to make this distinction natural about um, uh, incentives versus kind of plumbing that sits underneath a system that might have incentives, um, I propose that we rename the project. Um, and part of this is because no one can pronounce it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, the, 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 the main reason uh, to, that I propose renaming the project um, is as follows. I propose that we call it IPCS. Um, and that is because IPCS will be for compute, what IPFS is for storage. Um, and in particular, there's the, this little two by two matrix up here um, that should make sense. Um, IPFS is a volunteer network for storage, and Filecoin is the persistence layer on top of that that adds incentives. Um, IPCS should be the volunteer network uh, for compute. And there will not yet be uh, an incentive um, on top of it, although there is kind of space for that in the future. So the goals then of the uh, of IPCS are a rock solid scheduler, high reliability, high scale, and some Byzantine fault tolerance to a point. Um, and uh, I'll talk about that uh, in as we go through this. Um, it's actually harder in some ways to do Byzantine fault tolerance when you don't have incentives, because some of the approaches to the game theory of enforcing behavior rely on things like staking and slashing and things like that. Um, and if you don't have those, then you have to use different approaches. Um, so here's the master plan, right? Um, please do actually tell everyone about this if you want. <laughs> this is a joke that you should keep it secret. Um, uh, but um, yeah, please do tweet it. We're going to use this old uh, product chestnut. I don't know if everyone's seen this, but it's uh, 
I think this came out of Spotify. The way to ship software products is not to try and build the whole car up front. It's to build a skateboard that's a little bit useful and learn from that. And then, I don't know, put a flag on it for some reason to make it shiny and then ship a bike and then a motorbike and then a car. Because at each, the point here is that it, at each point, you've got something useful rather than having to wait like nine months before you've, before you've got anything useful. So um, the master plan is, uh, is described in those terms. So the first release is going to be a basic system that only supports deterministic execution. Then we're going to add scale, some scale. Then we're going to add some reliability. Then we're going to make it support multiple files rather than just one file at a time. Then we're going to add more scale. Um, and then we're going to address performance. Um, then we're going to address some Byzantine fault tolerance. Then we're going to extend the system to uh, support pipelines and DAGs rather than just single jobs um, to kind of describe a, a pipeline system that, um, that Juan alluded to earlier. We're going to attempt to add some more Byzantine fault tolerance in, in phase nine. And then if we have time, we're going to finally tackle my favorite chestnut of non-deterministic execution um, and Filecoin integration, although we may end up moving the Filecoin integration piece earlier in the project. Um, so. I'm not going to go into detail about how we're going to do each one of these steps, but I'm going to tell the story of what it's going to feel like at each step. Um, and it's intentional that there are some negative adjectives in here because it, it helps you understand like what this journey is going to be like as we go through it. So we're going to start by building a system for unreliably running a single deterministic program on a small file, which is already in IPFS, assuming everyone is trustworthy and there's only 10 people on the network. And then we're going to put that thing public. I got two thumbs up. Great. <laughs> um, we're going to uh, test whether we can do this by trying to run cloud detection on a single Landsat image, because we've already got the Landsat data set, hopefully in IPFS. Um, I know it's in Filecoin. Hopefully it's in IPFS. If it isn't, we'll just publish it there. We'll put it there ourselves. Um, we we'll get the result back, and you just verify it by eye. So that's so. Th this is already the the goal here is this is already a useful. <laughs> thing for someone to be able to do if they want to process uh, data on the Landsat data set. They may well be able to verify by eye um, because they might only be doing it on 100 images and they can just scroll through them and check they all look like they got grayscaled. Um, so yeah, you know, that's step one. Step two is try and scale that from 10 nodes to 100 nodes and have it be able to process over 100 terabytes of data um, in IPFS. At that point, we might have an error rate. And we can be able to, we'll be able to measure that error rate. Um, and so what that might feel like is that we throw another 90 nodes into the network or other people show up and add nodes to the network. And at first things break, but throughout the course of this phase, um, we release new versions that make things incrementally better. And by the end of the phase, the network's working well, although it might now feel a bit slow and there might still be an error rate, even though it will be less than it was. Um, we're then going to try and make that thing more reliable. So we're going to try and make it work 99% of the time. Um, we should be able to test that by submitting 10K jobs and observing that on average, at most 100 of them fail. Uh, but it might, at this point, be kind of slow. It might take a while to resolve each job. Um, by the end of this phase, uh, the goal is that, yeah, job execution is significantly more reliable. And I'll give you some insight into the kind of reliability issues we're expecting to see. Um, and how we might solve them. For example, at this point, the system will have no way of stopping nodes from being becoming over full, as in trying to take on more work than they actually have CPU and RAM for. And so we'll have to put in uh, uh, like CPU and memory limits on the nodes at that point to stop the nodes running out of memory and, and crashing. Um, so that's kind of how we, how we potentially see this unfolding. Um, then we're going to add support for multiple files um, so that you could say, for example, submit a job on a directory in IPFS, and it should shard that work across all of the constituent files uh, in the network um, or batches of them. That's all TBD in this section, um, uh, still using data locality where possible. Then we're going to try and scale the system up to 1,000 nodes. I understand um, IPFS is currently on 15,000 nodes. Is that about right? Oh, 350,000. Okay, that's news. Yeah, cool. Okay, uh, that's helpful. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're going to be a, sub, a small subset of the of the scale of IPFS. Um, but you know, like when we get up to a thousand nodes, you might start finding that 
the amount of metadata about the jobs becomes significant. And if there's a lot of jobs coming in per second, then we're going to need to do some optimizations around the data structures that are there and um, perhaps like shard things out into multiple lib P2P, like gossip sub channels and so on. Um, and then at this point, the idea is many users can run Landsat data workloads in parallel, and there might be some other public data sets that people start using uh, in the network. Maybe there's some biomedical images, or there's nine, and there's nine other use cases. Who knows? Um, and everyone can do that without the network failing. Is the is the goal of phase five? Um, and then phase six is trying to make that thing fast. Um, we should be able to, by the end of phase six, do hundreds of job executions per second. Um, and uh, resolve those jobs within a few seconds rather than minutes. That's kind of the broad um, uh, idea there. Um, uh, so phase seven gets kind of interesting. Um, this is where um, we want to add support for um, up to 10% of the nodes in the network being malicious. And so we are explicitly bounding that at 10% in order to make our lives easier. Um, and um, I won't go into all the details about this because we'll run out of time, um, but we've got some ideas on, uh, on, on how we can tolerate uh, some percentage of, of failures or some percentage of, of, of bad actors um, by like evenly distributing the work, the verification jobs across a bunch of, uh, evenly across the network and, uh, and then looking at that trace, uh, well, uh, looking at hashes of the outputs as opposed to the trace data, because we're still assuming everything's deterministic at this point. Um, then um, I think this pipelines and DAGs thing is going to be quite interesting. I'd actually love to hear more from kind of Phil and Enrico on like how useful this will be for data scientists. Um, but you can imagine a Landsat job that isn't just one job. It's like a sequence of steps. You grayscale the image and then you downscale it and then you do something else or you do fan out and fan in. Um, and uh, Lots of interesting things we could do there. Um, then phase nine, by the way, the end of phase eight is tentatively, uh, we think we will be in around October at this point. So this kind of, um, this might be a good time to do another kind of big ta-da. I mean, we will have been releasing this continuously throughout at the end of each phase, but at the end of, at the end of phase eight in October, we're going to have a pretty fast, pretty reliable public compute network that supports pipelines and all this fancy stuff. And at that point, it's worth maybe doing some kind of big announcement around it or whatever. Um, and then additional to that, um, uh, more Byzantine fault tolerance. Um, uh, and then my favorite non-deterministic execution, um, which um, would be a good kind of proof that um, the system is pluggable in terms of verification strategies, at least. If we say we've got support for non-deterministic execution and we've got this trace-based verification, at least that forces us to demonstrate that the interfaces are valid. Um, and yeah, phase 11, phase 11 file point integration does what it says on the tin. Um, but we would have to um, give uh, IPCS nodes access to a file coin wallet that they can spend money to um, uh, get data out of Filecoin and put data back into Filecoin programmatically. Um, so yeah, the, out of those phases, that's kind of the journey that we see to production, the journey over the next few months. Obviously, there's a bunch of on-conference topics that, that kind of fall out of that. So um, I'll put these on the board later. Um, so that's the end of that talk, but I will warn you, we have another talk that's much shorter that we are going to try and do in the next 30 minutes, unless people want to take a break and come back in 10 minutes, five minutes. Um, yeah, yeah, lunch after 30 minutes. I think I'll battle through it quickly. We're going to break for more lunch. Yeah, okay, great. Cool. I mean, obviously, if people need to take a break, do it at any time. Um, so, um, I'll do the first two slides and then hand over to you first, okay? Uh, I feel like we've already said this a lot today, but we're not building this all ourselves. Um, we want your help. We want to be able, we want to build these foundational pieces that enable other teams to launch other projects that use, that share this code. And, um, and um, yeah, we want to make, we want to help make everyone in the space successful. Um, 
kind of rising tide lifts all boats, that sort of thing. Um, so in order to deliver on that goal, uh, we need to make things pluggable. So coming back to um, the octopus of doom, or whatever you want to call this, uh, this diagram, um, we've got these pluggable pieces, the verifier, the compute, and the storage, which we want to have pluggable at runtime, and then the scheduler, which is core, uh, and a kind of optional reputation system. So should I hand over to you, Kai, to do the rest of this? As, as we've said, like, the scheduler is the core of the system, really. Like, it's the mechanism by which requester nodes and compute nodes communicate with each other in terms of, I want a job run, I want to bid on a job, I accept your job, here's some results, I accept those results, right? So that back and forth that we saw in the animations is all of that goes via the scheduler. Now, an important concept is like things that change the state of the world versus hooks that you hear about some change of the world. And this is where I would have shown you the code, but I'll just talk about it, right? So submit job is, is a function of the interface. It changes the state of the world. Um, a job was just submitted, right? And that leads directly on to self-selection. Like, do I want to bid on that job based on, at the moment in time, do I have the CID local? But there could be lots of other parameters that affect that decision, right? So when we have economic incentives, what's the value of the job? Is it even worth me thinking about doing that job? What's the CPU memory profile of the job? How long do we think it's going to take? There's a whole bunch of stuff that comes into play when, as a compute node, I hear about a job arriving on the network and I want to make a decision as to whether I want to bid on it. Now, how do we build an interface for that? It's going to be hard. So subscription callback approach is essentially saying in the compute node there's a subscription callback that says hey a job just arrived on the network um do you want to bid on it or not so there is a function in the interface that says bid on job what happens between those two events a job arrived and now i'm going to bid on it that could be arbitrary user code that only that compute node plugs in like how do we implement that it could be a hook it could be a job has arrived call out to my custom function that makes a decision based on all of those parameters that I have authored for my specific use case for my compute node. And that could be, I don't know, is it a Tuesday, therefore bid on the job? It's complete, it should be absolutely up to the compute node operator as to what logic decides on whether I bid on that job. So the core approach of the schedule interface is to kind of have these two these two halves of it really is like the moment you've made a decision, call these functions to change the state of the world, right? So a function is bid on job. Here is a subscription event system that you can hear about when things have happened that you may want to then make a decision about. And that happens at both ends of the equation. So the compute node, an example we just walked through is a job has arrived, do I want to bid on it? So I'm gonna make a decision. At the moment in the, in the prototype, that is literally, do I have this CID locally? AKA IPFS refs local, right? As in, there is no pluggability at the moment for that decision, but there can be because the, of the way the interface works. So the other side of the equation is a bid has just arrived from a compute node. Do I want to accept that bid? And that comes down now to the reputation of that compute node. How many other compute nodes have bid on that job? And again, it's a good example of, I've listened to an event that's just happened I can decide what to do with that event, turn back around and call the accept bid function on the interface. So we've tried very hard to kind of walk the line between having enough opinion that the thing's useful and not having too much of an opinion where you can't now have your own opinion, right? And it's the, always the challenge of any interface is where's the right line in the sound. So I think maybe what, at one part in the next day and a half, like I'll grab my laptop or it's on GitHub, like let's have a look at the scheduler interface yeah. that does exist. Let's walk through in our minds what kind of scenarios that doesn't fit very well with or what have we not thought about. I mean, that's just gold dust to hear from all of you at this moment. Um, hooks for self-selection and bid acceptance. That's what I've just described there, right? So this is an interesting concept. So compute verification as in like, how do we make an interface for running a compute job, producing some artifacts, comparing those artifacts across lots of compute jobs that are run on different nodes and coming to some decision about that. And how do you make that generic enough so that you could put it, you know, you could write your own implementation fairly easily. And again, it's, it's quite a hard thing. Uh, I'll just say, this is the, the dashed line in this diagram. It's kind of like, how do you um, 
decouple the verification and the compute interface without um, yeah, having every verifier need to know about every compute yep. um, implementation and vice versa. So, sorry, carry on. No, that's good. And, and so I, one approach that we're taking, and I say you kind of heavy double quotes, one approach, hence like we could always take a different approach and I can't stress enough, like it's not, hey, here's what we're going to do. This is not what's happening in this moment, right? It's like, here's what we're thinking of doing. Please tell us we're wrong. <laughs> so that would be a good thing uh, for the next, the next day or so. Here is the idea as it stands, right? Is there is a, an artifact format that the compute engine needs to produce. So that could be a hash of the output. It could be a memory trace. In the demo that we've seen, we're saying there is a memory trace that the compute implementation will produce in the form of an artifact. That's one half of this equation. The compute engine knows how to produce that format, right? The other half of the equation is given a whole collection of those artifacts, come to a determination about who is, who is uh, being honest and who is not being honest. So let's think of a deterministic equivalent of the demo we've seen. It's a lot simpler than what we've seen. In the one we've seen, it's wrap the job with PS record, hence producing memory metrics. Um, that's the artifact side. That's the compute node saying, I can produce some evidence that I did a thing. Um, the other side of the equation, the thing that's happening on the requester node is the k-means clustering over those artifacts to decide who are the outliers. Put those two things together and you've got what we could call a verification implementation, right? The deterministic version is quite a lot simpler. The compute node needs to produce a hash as its artifact, right? What hash algorithm do we pick? Well, that's now down to your choice of implementation, but it's a hash of some kind that needs to line up across all of the compute nodes that have actually performed the work. There's no way you could know what that hash is if you didn't do the work. The artifact would be encrypted between the compute node and the requester node, so nobody can just copy what you've produced. The requester node side of deterministic compare the hashes is fairly simple. Uh, who, who has not got the correct hash is the way that you determine an outlier. Um, ZK snarks, for example, it, it's like the compute node needs to produce a proof. I mean, how does it do that? That's up to the implementation that we plug in for um, that verification, um, as in you'd need to produce a ZK snark of having done the work. At the other end, it's compare all of the snarks. We could continue on that vein, as in it should be fairly trivial to implement whichever verification strategy we need. The core thing about this slide is how do we how does the compute node and the requester node interact with this verification strategy? And the concept is the compute node produces some known format of evidence, yeah. right? And that's a hash or a memory trace or a ZK snark or the other thing that we're plugging in. And then the requester node knows how to compare those artifacts. And how do we manifest this as an interface is a very interesting question. This is this is, I think, where we are in this room today and tomorrow. Let's talk about what should look like. We will then go and implement all of our learnings. That's where we're at in the project. Uh, the the uh, prototype that you've seen has no interface for verification, right? It just wraps the job in PS record and uses k-means clustering at the other end. So we need to extract that into an interface and then hopefully write lots of alternatives. And I, I just give a concrete example of this evidence types to help um, clarify the idea, which is that um, suppose you have uh, a Docker runtime and a WASM runtime, um, and you have a, um, uh, a trace-based verification verifier, right? Um, the trace-based verification verifier, oper it, it operates on CPU and memory traces, so it declares that it wants CPU and memory traces. The Docker implementation of how you trace the CPU and memory uh, might be very different from the way you do that in the WASM runtime. Um, but because the evidence type is, it specifies the specific format of like, I want a CSV file where each line is a, a one a per second sample of CPU and memory, um, they, can, they can both produce an artifact that can be consumed by the same verifier without the, um, um, without the trace-based um, uh, without the trace-based verifier needing to know specific details about how WASM and Docker work, um, and that's kind of the best way I have to describe the point of of this kind of decoupling. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's a useful idea. Uh, I'd love to get uh, people's feedback on it um, at the end.
And then this, this is um, somewhat simpler, the compute and storage interfaces like Juan mentioned IPLD programs, which is very interesting. Let's, let's express the program that's going to be run as IPLD. If we've done a good job of these interfaces, uh, that should be an equivalent implementation to I want to run the following Docker image that's got my work in it versus I've already compiled a WASM binary and it lives here, run that for me versus I want to start a firecracker VM and just run arbitrary commands. Like it should be possible depending on the nature of our workload and which verification engine that we're choosing to use with that workload to, to heavily underline that clarification. Like it should be possible for this network to support a variety of compute interfaces when it comes to actually running the job. Now we might choose to stay with like in that first iteration, right? We're gonna do WASM with deterministic workloads. Like but it, the interface should make it possible to do basically any other version of compute that you want. The same, I think, is true of storage. We're going to start off with IPFS. It's an interesting concept, though, with the actual interface, because when we say storage interface, it's more about like how do we how do we manifest the storage to the compute job, right? So how the how the prototype works at the moment, as Luke showed in a slide, like we use IPFS uh, mount to get at the files that exist on the same, um, the IPFS host, we need to manifest those files inside the, the VM. So, okay, we'll just IPFS mount, uh, IPFS daemon dash dash mount inside the VM, and we can now get to all of the files on the host. That's one example of what we'd call the storage interface. So it's less like, hey, here is a type of storage. It's more, how do we actually manifest that storage and the data into the compute job to be read from the correct location? Another example would be like the concept of volumes. So a bit like how Docker volumes work, it's like, hey, I've got this storage somewhere on my host. I want it to be mounted in this location inside the workload. And then as far as the workload's concerned, you have no idea about where that data came from on the host. You're just mounting it at a known file path and the job expects the data to be at that file path. So the storage interface looks after how that actually happens. And it's, a, it's, not, an easy, it's not the easiest of, of, of things to implement because, for example, with our prototype, like how do we bootstrap IPFS daemon dash dash mount? Like now the compute node needs to kind of think about that because it needs to do that before the job runs. There's a whole bunch of like different approaches we can take, especially with using Docker. There's a, there's a simple way that we can have an IPFS container that's almost like a sidecar to the job. My brain is now going into, I want to implement this interface for one use case. I think the whole point would be, let's collaboratively take a step back. Everyone else thinks, yeah, but I've got this other type of storage car. You've not even thought about it. Does that work with your interface? I think this would be the discussion to have in the unconference, right? Because like, let's pour all of our brains into a pot and stir it around and come out with some interfaces with means we've got a good, we've done a good job. And so, yeah, so, some examples, I think, of how this fits together. So uh, with ZK Snarks, like the, the artifact that the verification uh, module on the compute node is producing is a snark, and the, the requester node knows how to consume those snarks to check who has performed correctly or who has lied. The homomorphic encryption, like this almost is a case of, it's, I think this is just a good example of something that should just work rather than having to build an uh, implementation for, because in my mind, I might be wrong and happy to be corrected, but like, the data on the storage driver is already encrypted. So we're just mounting that data into the compute job. The compute job already understands it's working with a hom homomorphic uh, storage volume. Whether there's any, any actual hardware that's needed to do homomorphic encryption, I'm not sure. Um, not necessarily, right? So the, the point I suppose I'm making is homomorphic, homomorphic encryption should be possible at the user layer as opposed to for us to have to do anything specific to support it. But it's an interesting example to throw up on the board because like, maybe I'm wrong when we say that and it'd be interesting to check if that's true and do we need to do anything in order to support homomorphic encryption? Question mark. Um, optimistic verification is a good example of what we're already doing. As in, we're just going to assume everyone's going to be correct and we'll check afterwards to see if they're correct or not, as opposed to the deterministic hash based system, which we could almost say um, isn't optimistic. It's kind of, you know, we can immediately check if people are lying because they don't have their hashes lining up. I think the point of, again, I'd like just to be a broken record, like the point of this is to add to this list of working examples. 
do a sanity check, like do these examples fit with what we're planning on doing with interfaces and emerge with uh, a high level of confidence that our, inter our interfaces cover yeah. all of the use cases. There you go. There's, there's basically what I just said, like call to action. Yes. Yeah. I think we're done.